Radioactive decay. So we have two goals in this session. We'll look at trends in the chart of the nucleides, and we'll also look at how a sample of radioactive material decays as time goes by. So consider this wonderful shape here. This is showing you the uh, sort of stable nuclei, and nuclei at least that last for long enough that we can uh, measure their properties and stuff. So the black ones here in the middle down the spine kind of represent the absolutely stable ones. All the other ones decay by some radioactive process. And the decays tend to move the nuclei toward this central spine there. So there's some of them which are colored blue, kind of above that spine. So what do you think the decay is that's represented by blue? So you might want to pause there and see what you think. Okay, so what happens there is this is plotting uh, a neutron number on the horizontal axis and the proton number on the vertical axis. There's a line of z equals n, and if you're pretty far down on the periodic table, then the really stable nuclei follow the line z equals n, equal number of protons and neutrons. Far beyond that though, you need more neutrons to keep the nucleus together. And in general what happens is beta plus takes you down and to the right. And if you're above that zone of stability there, it would take you toward that zone of stability. So beta plus increases neutrons by one and decreases protons by one. Because a proton in beta plus turns into a neutron and a positron and an electron, anti, uh, an electron neutrino. Okay, similarly, beta minus, you go the other way. That's taking you from the pink region more toward the uh, that central stable spine there. And then you've got the yellow ones, which are the alphas. And alpha decay brings you down in, uh, down in n by 2 and down in z by 2, because you're spitting out a helium nucleus. Okay, but all of them take you toward that stable zone where the black ones are. Okay, so radioactivity. Very statistical process. We cannot say when an individual nucleus is going to decay. We just can say, you know, something about the probability it's going to decay in a certain time interval. But if you have a very large number of nuclei, then you can do, do a pretty good job predicting what's going to happen. Turns out that the rate at which nuclei decay is proportional to the number of nuclei there are. And so there is our expression for that. The rate is minus delta n over delta t is lambda n, lambda of course being the uh, decay constant. So this is what we call the activity, how many nuclei decay per second and lambda is the decay constant. Okay, so whenever the rate at which something occurs happens to be proportional to the number of objects, then the decay is exponential, and you can write it like with an equation that looks like this. The number you have at some point in time, n, is the number you start with, n naught, times e to the minus lambda t. Lambda being the decay constant that's connected to the uh, half-life. There's a nice graph that shows what the shape of that is. Again, that's the initial number, t equals zero, number remaining. The decay constant is related to the half-life via this equation. The half-life, t one half, is natural log of two divided by the decay constant. Natural log of two to three significant figures is 0.693. Okay, so there's one way to write it. You can also write it in this form, n is n naught, over 2 to the time over the half-life. So in fact, that really means t to the uh, number of half-lives that have gone by. So if t happens to be three half-lives, then you get three half-lives over a half-life, that's just three, you get two cubed. So it's n is n not over eight in that case. Okay, so 
activity, as we talked about, is uh, number of decays per unit time. And the SI unit for that is known as the Becquerel. Uh, more commonly, we might use the Curie instead. And it turns out that one Curie is 3.7 times 10 to the 10 decays per second. And that's what a Becquerel is, decay per second. So that's 3.7 times 10 to the 10th Becquerels. Okay, so you can actually use radioactivity to measure the age of something. So this is commonly done with carbon-14, but you can use other uh, materials as well. And when it's used with carbon-14, you call it radiocarbon dating. Okay, so the trick when you're doing this is to use something that has a half-life uh, on the order of the age you're trying to measure. Okay, so why does carbon-14 do this, or why can we use it and do this? Well, living things take up carbon. And there's kind of a constant, roughly constant, one atom of carbon-14 for every 8.3 times 10 to the 11 atoms of carbon. And that's roughly stable. It's a good question to ask how that stability occurs, but there's a good reason for it. Okay, so if an organism dies, it stops taking in new carbon from its surroundings and the carbon-14 decays. Carbon-14 happens to have a half-life of 5,730 years. So it's useful for measuring ages of objects that are several hundred to several tens of thousands of years old. And here's some applications dating the Shroud of Turin. That was dated to the 13th to 14th century. And then they dug up this guy, Utzi the Iceman, in the Alps in 1991 and dated him to around 3300 BC. Okay, so let's do an example. So you find a wooden spear and you find the activity level is 35% of what you would expect from an equivalent uh, piece of wood if you just chopped it down today or last week. How old is the spear handle? Okay, so what we can do here is that we say n is n naught e to the minus lambda t. But in this case, n is now decayed from n naught to just 35% of n naught, 0.35 n naught. So then we get the n naughts to cancel out. We get 0.35 is e to the minus lambda t. All right, take the natural log of both sides, then you rescue the minus lambda t from the, exp the exponent. Solve for time, t is minus ln 0.35 over lambda. Uh, bring in the half-life, and lambda, remember, is ln 2 over the half-life, and so what you end up with is uh, ln of 0.35, that's a negative number, by the way. Any number less than 1 has a logarithm, which is negative. Divide by ln 2, multiply by 5730, you got your answer. And it turns out to be 8,680 years, approximately. Okay, so there's a good example of how you use that decay equation. And that is all for today.